Fastball. Belton deep to left. Five, three. I don't believe it. Alex Rodriguez. Going for three. Holy smokes. Back in a well-hit ball. High away. I don't believe it. Sorry, it's over. Maybe you just look at Sweet. Holy cow, the kid has done it. It is a grand salami. Unbelievable catch. I don't believe it. Goodbye, baseball. They do it. The 20 Greatest Moments in Mariners History. Twenty years ago, the Mariners were born. Major League Baseball had come back to Seattle, and the celebration was led by Mariners part owner Danny Kaye. Take me out to the ball. The prize, of course, included a parade. Baseball fever was citywide. They paraded the players through, and there were people lining the streets and people cheering. This was really something. I mean, baseball was back in Seattle. Major League Baseball had returned to Seattle, and that was a great occasion. It really was. Opening night, 1977, we had uh, a capacity crowd here first, first for the first game ever. And I was really excited, and, and, and the fans were excited. My teammates were excited at the time. We played uh, California Angels. Once again, Seattle's finest fans were ready to enjoy big league baseball. And the starting pitcher for the Mariners that day was former Seattle pilot Diego Segui. Wilson, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the initial voyage of the Seattle Mariners' Diego Segui. The first pitch in history is a strike, taken at the knees by Jerry Remy, leading it off. And the crowd roared. Everything about this historic day was perfect. Everything, that is, except the final score. California 7, Seattle nothing. In 1979, first baseman Bruce Bakke had a rock-solid year for the Mariners. He hit 316 with 16 home runs and 100 RBIs. So good was Bruce, he represented Seattle at the 50th Major League All-Star Game, which took place at the Kingdome. And Bakhti was bowled over by his reception. I was real nervous. Just the fact that the, the, the spotlight was sort of on me because uh, I was the representative from the Seattle team that year uh, really made me edgy. and. Uh, I was uh, overwhelmed by the fact that I got a standing ovation. I didn't really expect it. The hometown fans raised their praise to another level when Bhakti, with the game tied at five in the sixth, got the chance to put the American League on top. Ground ball. I think the energy at the stadium at the time was so intense and everybody was pulling for me that what would have might have been normally a ground ball hit into the AstroTurf so hard that it bounced over the shortstop's head into left field for a hit. And uh, uh, it was a very unusual hit for me, but it did, um, it did the job and it put the American League ahead and it was a big moment. I think the All-Star game probably had to be, uh, no doubt, the, the most, it was certainly the pinnacle moment of my career. I was keyed up uh, maybe uh, for a week after that because of that event. In 1981, just like today, beating the New York Yankees gave Seattle fans cause for celebration. And nobody played a bigger role in that quest than Tom Pashorek. On May the 8th, Pashorek hit a solo home run in the ninth inning to give Seattle a soul-satisfying 3-2 victory over their cross-continent rival. I think when the Yankees come in, it's a big thing for, for the Mariners. Uh, it was at that time to go ahead and try and and beat that club. And just because you wear, you know, pinstripes or it says New York across your your uniform, the people are going to fall down and, and die on you. As a matter of fact, that, uh, when it said New York on the uniform, it made our people play that much harder. 
they just kill him. I, I don't know. I, I think maybe it's a little let down on the Yankees' part and the fact that the Mariners get great joy in beating the Yankees. The next night was bat night, but the Yankees swung their bats to a 5-3 to three lead, and then with two on and two out in the ninth, Peshorek took another shot at stardom. 2-1 pitch to Peshorek. Fastball swung on and belted the left. Winfield locks up. The Mariners win it again. It will fly away. Oh, my. I don't believe it. That was, really was by far the biggest thrill I've ever had in baseball because um, uh, there was a lot of fans. I think there was about 60,000 fans there, and it was kind of an opportunistic night. If you were going to do anything good, that was a great night to, to, to do it. In. The place just went berserk. He came out. It was the first time I ever seen someone come out for a curtain call. I went out to the dugout, and the place was just going crazy. To win two games back-to-back -back at home in Seattle against the Yankees, that was great. And to hear Dave Niehaus call the home run, I mean, you couldn't ask for it. A, a better moment. Out to the left, Winfield locks up. The Mariners win it again. It will fly away. Oh my! I don't believe it. Seattle graciously welcomed Gaylord Perry in 1982 as the veteran pitcher closed in on his 300th career win. It hasn't happened since 1963. That was the year that Hurley Wynn became a 300 game winner. And tonight, Gaylord Perry tries to equal that achievement. An effort this evening to become the 15th player in big league history to win 300 games. Willie Randolph steps in and the first pitch is a fastball in and over for a strike. And we are underway. Oh, I remember a dramatic night. I mean, everyone went to the ballpark anticipating a record, you know, and it was just delightful because uh, he responded and the crowd, you could just feel it happen. You can just feel the crowd, every pitch, closer and closer and closer to it. At the end, people were standing, and everyone was standing, you know, cheering him on for the final pitch. And it was a very, very exciting and dramatic moment for this franchise, and, uh, you know, people still talk about it. Willie Randolph is up, and there's two outs, and the crowd is just standing all over the place. Now I'm beginning to sweat. I can feel myself. I got it. I'm getting high. My adrenaline is flowing and all, and I'm thinking, a pop-up, check swing. Come on, right to me, right to me. What does Randolph do? ground ball to me. On May the 6th, 1982, Gaylord Perry, one out away from 300. The 2-1 pitch to Randolph, swung on, ground ball to Cruz. This should do it. He's got it. It's over. Gaylord has 300. Everybody mobbing Gaylord Perry as he goes all the way. His teammates come out, but pulling, and Gaylord Perry becomes the 15th man in baseball history to win 300 games as the Mariners beat the Yankees 7-3. My, oh, my. For me to be able to go ahead and manage a, a person who won his 300th game and managing uh, Gaylord Perry, who's a Hall of Famer, by no, you know, no doubt, uh, was an emotional thing for me, too. Oh, heck broke loose for us. It was like us winning the World Series. Uh, they had the you know, champagne and everything else. Here's to you, fellas. Everybody over 40. Hey, Gaylord! How does it feel, Gaylord? It was great, I tell you. It's like the uh, last game of World Series out there. How about 400? <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> When it comes to being a youngster in the Seattle organization, nobody did it better than Alvin Davis, who began his career with a break. Kenny Phelps broke his hand, and the call came down to Salt Lake City, and I came up about the fourth game of the season. I uh, got in about the seventh game, I guess, and had a good night, and been there ever since. Alvin slipped quietly onto the Seattle scene in 1984, but not so quietly, he started to hit home runs, lots of home runs. And pretty soon, Alvin became a household name. Well, at first of all, there was sort of disbelief on the part of local fans because he started out with so much power and, uh, and just was, was chewing up the pitch in the first month of the season. And people didn't know who Alvin Davis was uh, when they finally became uh, so enamored with Alvin. Somebody uh, decided once that he sh his name should be Al Davis uh, rather than Alvin, and the people just, the fans just wouldn't allow that to happen. He was Alvin, and the people only want nice things to happen to Alvin Davis. He's just, uh, just that type of a person. 
Out of the blue, Alvin rewrote the Seattle record books. He still holds the team rookie records with 97 walks, 161 hits, 34 doubles, 282 total bases, 116 RBIs, and of course, 27 home runs. And the 1-1 pitch to Alvin, swung on and dealt it deep to right center field. Castillo looks up, it is Grand Salami time, Alvin Davis, and the ends are right back in at 64, my, oh my! Alvin represented Seattle in the 84 All-Star Game. And to no one's surprise, he went on to become the only Seattle player to date to be named Rookie of the Year, a Mariner moment that lasted an entire season. You know, that was the highlight, I think, of uh, my whole life, really, up to that point. And uh, just to uh, go out and, and have a super year like that and be rewarded, uh, you know, from the media and the people involved with baseball that, that, you know, had the best year of any first year player that year. It was really just something else. And, and uh, it's meant a lot to my life. And, and it's something that uh, I'll be able to tell my grandkids about, you know, with pride that, uh, you know, one year I went out there and and had a very good year, and, and I was ahead of my class. In 1987, second baseman Harold Reynolds became the first and only Mariner to lead the league in stolen bases. Reynolds swiped 60 of them, the only time Ricky Henderson did not win the title in a 12-season span. I tell you, anytime you can beat Ricky Henderson in a stolen base title, uh, that was really something that was really special to me. And uh, Willie Wilson put a lot of pressure on me at the end of the year, so it wasn't like I just kind of waltzed into it. So I ended up winning on the last day, as a matter of fact, and uh, that's something that I'll always remember. Something else he'd remember that year was being named to the 87 All-Star team. He also led American League second baseman in double plays, assists, and putouts. I think everybody, whether you're an offensive threat or not, wants to be known for your defense, too. Fly ball into shallow center field. Griffey races in. Vizquel going out along with Reynolds. Reynolds is sliding. Catch to Rob. Leo Gomez of a base hit. I didn't think anybody was going to be able to get to it, but Reynolds came out from nowhere, and he makes an incredible catch to take away a hit. When you make a great play on somebody, I don't think anything tops that. You know, when you dive and you're fully extended, you get up and throw them out, and you see them throwing their helmet when they get back to the dugout. <laughs> That's probably the, the biggest thrill. I love that, because I know I got to them. A royal flush filled the kingdom in 1990 when Detroit tried to hit Randy Johnson. He threw the first pitch like 99, he threw the last pitch like 99. As the innings went on, Randy got stronger and just dominated. The hitters weren't digging in on me and getting comfortable up there, and I wasn't uh, the polished pitcher that I guess I can assume I am now, where I don't walk, uh, you know, 10 guys a game. There was constantly people uh, on base and I was pitching out of trouble most of the game. Uh, there was no real spectacular catches except for one I believe and, and Junior was out in center field to catch that. It was a ball hit in the, uh, the gap and it hung up just long enough for, uh, for Junior to get under and catch. As the game progressed it became clear that Johnson was en route to near perfection. The first no hitter in Mariners history. Late in the game uh, you start realizing uh, what's what's materializing. Fans ready to explode. Here comes the 0-2 pitch on the way to fielder. Fastball! High! A high fastball. That's seven strikeouts. Randy Johnson is one strike away. 24,000 incredibly rabid Mariner fans are looking for that final strike. The 0-2 pitch on the way. Flag! It's over! He has done it! High fastball! Randy Johnson being mobbed by Scott Bradley. 
Tom to greet him and the entire Mariner team. My, oh my. All I remember is the, the strike three pitch, and that was about, uh, you know, uh, probably chest high, neck high, but out over the plate. Mike Keith swung through the ball, and it was strike three, and I knew at that moment that I'd done something pretty special. It's been one of probably uh, two or three uh, highlights of my career here in Seattle. I was here first. You should get seen. In 1990, Seattle had the honor of witnessing the first father and son to play on the same team. This is, I guess, the, the pinnacle, really. This is the thing that uh, in my career that uh, I'm very proud of. Very proud of. Yes, on August the 31st, Ken Sr. and Ken Jr. got the chance to take the field together for the very first time in a major league game. It's probably the most exciting moment that I've had, is being able to run out in the outfield with my dad. But even that feat paled in comparison to the events of September the 14th against California. First inning, Ken Sr. with the first crack. Swing and a high fly ball deep into left center field, wide back to the one track, goodbye baseball! Ken Griffey Sr. As he's running the bases, I'm looking at him. And he touches home plate, and he goes, that's how you do it, son. And walks him back out. And then when I hit my... And now for only the icing on the cake. Would it be something if Junior would come up with a home run right here? Here's the pitch on the way, swinging a fly ball deep into left field. Way back, going back. Goodbye, baseball. They do it. And the Griffies, for the first time ever in the history of the game of baseball, father and son with back-to-back -back home runs. Can you believe it? Everybody was in shock uh, that it happened. I couldn't wait to get in the dugout so I could say, that's how you do it, Dad. But uh, he waited till I congratulated everybody that he gave me a hug. He said, we did it. We did something that may not ever be done. You know, that's a very special moment. That uh, is something that would probably never happen again. That would probably be one of two uh, highlights uh, of Junior's career up to this point. Martinez working on a bat, a tool that he uses very well. He is absolutely amazing with those pitches right in his kitchen. Well, he's simply the best hitter in baseball. He is something. This time he picks the right field line. Edgar's a, a professional hitter. You know, that's what he does best. And he, go out, he goes out there every day and uh, hits the ball hard uh, and gives you what he got. That ball is hit hard and long and gone. Edgar Martinez, and just one of the reasons why Edgar Martinez is an all-star. The incredibly consistent Edgar Martinez won his first batting title in 1992. In 95, he captured number two with a 356 average, the highest by a right-hander since Joe DiMaggio in 1939. Martinez became just the seventh right-handed hitter ever to win two American League batting titles. He also led the league in 1995 with 52 doubles. Edgar had a year that is almost indescribable, but uh, I guess uh, when you say Edgar, you just assume that uh, he's going to get a double. So Edgar Martinez with a double. When he came up to bat during the course of that season, everybody would look at one another after he hit a double, and, and they would uh, uh, sarcastically say, oh, that's rare that he would get another double, just because he did it so often that uh, it was... Uh, so common for him to be standing on second base after one of his at-bats. I was very satisfied with, with my job, and that, that's what it's all about, you, you know, feel satisfied about what you do. The thing I enjoy about Edgar the most is the way he goes out and uh, works hard, uh, tea work, the weight room, his diet. Uh, everything about Edgar is just a total professional, and uh, he's the guy I respect most in this clubhouse. The 1992 All-Star Game took place in San Diego, and without a doubt, it was Griffey's time to shine. Sinking fast, a base hit as Ken Griffey Jr. drives in the fourth run. 
Griffey, 23 years old, and he's been in three straight All-Star games. That's well hit the left. Bonds on the run, looking up, and it is gone. A line drive, opposite field home run for Ken Griffey Jr. And the first home run ever by a Seattle Mariner. How proud they must be up Seattle way. Griffey also added a double, and to the esteemed group of players around him, was taking on the look of an all-star game MVP. McGuire came up like, I think it was like the seventh inning, said congratulations. I mean, I said, for what? He said, for MVP. And I just shook my head, because you don't think about it. Heroic and humble. In 1993, Baltimore was the all-star site. But before the game even began, Griffey found himself locked in a torrid home run derby playoff against the Power Ranger himself, Juan Gonzalez. With Super Sluggers looking on, the Derby went to Gonzalez. But Griffey did do something no one had done before. Holy cow. That may have hit the warehouse, and they announced it did. <laughs> that may have damaged the warehouse. <laughs> Griffey, we're told, hit the warehouse eight feet up. And I figured it got out over that, the back wall, but I didn't think it was going there. I wasn't expecting it. That's a long way. I figured Mickey Tuttleman would be the first one to do it. Uh, Kurt Gibson, you know, those type of guys. But not me. <laughs> Come 1994, Griffey was acknowledged as a bona fide gem, one worth his weight in gold. Man, hold on. I'm 207. Get that. How much you got? 215. 215. Line. Well, you tipping the scales at about 275. 290. <laughs> 275. You get in the scale, they say, please, one at a time. <laughs> you a lock, man. Three, three. No. I'm the little guy in this group. Man, you the kid. Man, I'm the little guy. Little guys don't hit 33 at the, at the break. <laughs> Good point. And this home run derby was all Griffey. Left to right. This is a no doubter. Griffey is on the board. Mm. Can he win it this year? What hell? Yes. Yes, he can. <laughs> This time, there was no playoff necessary. Of that, Griffey made sure. Brings everything to the party. He can hit for average, he can hit for power, he can drive and run. Plus, he's got charisma to be a, a genuine superstar that uh, is well liked by the media and fans alike. And that's the total package. The date, April 22, 1993. Chris Bazio began his game against Boston with a pair of walks and a wild streak. But even then, there was a sign of good things to come. After the first pitch, could be two. Boone flipping to Vizquel, back to Martinez. Bazio quickly settled into a groove, and it soon became apparent to his teammates that this game might be more than a step above your typical well-pitched contest. As the game progressed, uh, I was watching some pretty incredible plays develop, and uh, I don't remember who it was, but I mentioned to somebody that uh, we're, we may see something pretty special here tonight. We did get a luck, couple lucky breaks, a uh, couple bounces went our way. There was a ball hit off of, uh, I believe it was Tino Martinez, and it ricocheted over towards second base and Brett Boone at the time was on the team, I believe it was, and uh, had fielded the ball and, and uh, I believe Basio was over at first base to make the out. And when you see stuff like that, you know things are going right for you because that's a pretty special play and uh, you know there was plays throughout the whole game 
that uh, Bosio was pitching that you knew something may develop. This kill, nice play to Martinez. Drives this one to left center field after it is grippy. Miles to first, flagged down by Martinez, a little flip to Bosio. Brett Boone helped provide Seattle with plenty of runs, but it was pitching that had captured the attention of the kingdom. You realize late in the game what is materializing, and I think everybody knows that uh, it's kind of a uh, superstition that uh, you don't talk to the pitcher when something like that is going on, and uh, you know you just go about your business and continue doing whatever you've been doing, and usually the pitcher will do the same thing. No hits through eight. Three outs to go. The first came by strikeout. And with his place in Seattle history achingly close, Bazio followed that with a ground out. 25 in a row retired by Chris Bazio and listen to this crowd. Bazio, his 2-1 pitch on the way, swung on high jumper with a mound. Charged by this kill. Barrett throws it over. And Bazio has done it. Even the the last uh, the last out with uh, Omar coming across the middle and, and, and throwing a throwing it to Tino, I mean if he bobbles it, I mean that's could be considered a base hit. And I'll never forget that. And then Boz sticking straight up to the sky, you know, with his fist up. When I got out to the mound, I kind of gave him a hug and I told him that that was probably for his grandfather that had passed away, and he just kind of smiled at me. No hitters are very special. Uh, I realize how hard they are to uh, achieve. When you see someone else throw it, now you're on the outside looking in. Uh, it's pretty special watching a no-hitter. And then the game started off like that, and you know, I took some aggression out in the in the clubhouse, and <laughs> I tell you, this is something else. I never expected this in my wildest dreams. The great thing about baseball is you never know what you're going to see. One thing Seattle fans had never seen was one of their own hit for the cycle. Until, that is, June the 23rd, 1993, when Jay Buhner began his quest. And he's deep to left center. A grand slam. Here's a base hit over blanket chip. Sierra not able to cut it all the way to the wall. Buhner's got at least two. He'll stop there. Here's a base hit for Jay Buhner. He's now three for three. Jay Buhner has homered, doubled, and singled. He is three-fourths on his way to the cycle. When you hit for the cycle, uh, boy, not only do you have to be on your power game that particular day, but you've got to have a pretty good stroke to go along with it. And during uh, that particular time, Jay was swinging the bat exceedingly well. Jay was using the whole field to hit with also. And the triple came last. <laughs> That's the toughest thing for a lot of people to do especially for uh, uh, Jay. Swung on, hit well into right center field. Back goes Sierra, and that ball is off the wall and gets away from Blankenship. Around second, he's going for three, and the fellow third is offline. Buter with a triple. Not only that, he becomes the first Mariner in history to hit for the cycle. I remember his face after uh, he is leaving third base. <laughs> how tired he looks. He popped up and he was winded. <laughs> so we need to run a few wind sprints. I was tired. <laughs> they, just, they threw a piano on my background second base. I didn't know if I'd ever get there. Had the throw been a little bit more online, I probably would have been out. But, uh, you know, it was a fortunate deal. I was able to get in there. And... 14 innings, uh, all of a sudden a triple. But, you know, it helped us win a ball game. That's what I also remember. Uh, we scored a run immediately afterwards, and that's when it's more enjoyable. It's away! Here comes Buhner! The Mariners win it! Uh, I went to third base and grabbed the bag for him because I felt that that's something that, that he should have. And uh, being the first Mariner to, to get that and being his friend, to me, that's something that he could put in his house and, and nobody can take that away from him. Yeah, it was special to be the first guy. I never thought that I'd be the first guy to get the hit for the cycle. But I think that's probably, for me, that's that's probably one of the biggest highlights of my career, hitting for a cycle, being the first Mariner to do it. Ken Griffey Jr. is special, that's a given, but he also has a specialty. 
It's the way he hits home runs. And one week in 1993, Griffey hit home runs in eight straight games. You know, I think that's only happened a few times in Major League Baseball. And in, in my 10 years of managing, I've had two players do that. Don Madley with the Yankees homer in eight straight games, and Junior's done it here. It was amazing uh, watching Junior go day by day. And uh, uh, with the streak, I mean, it's like every time he saw on the bat, he was making great contact. That pitch is belted deep to right, and it will fly away into the upper deck. O'Neill's going to watch this baby go into the bleachers. There's a drive deep toward right field. Wayne Kirby back as far as he can go. Ken Griffey Jr. has homered in three straight ball games. Do you have the feeling that if he got his pitch, he was going to hit another one out? Junior sends a fly ball to deep right center field, and Junior has his 26. That will fly away. And a high fly ball hit off the end of the bat. Back is Kirby to the track, the wall, and Junior has done it. He has tied the Mariner record for home runs in consecutive games. When Junior gets on a streak, uh, he's capable of doing anything. In that particular time, uh, the eight home runs came very easily. High fly ball to left field, fairly deep. Hill to the track, the wall. Junior has the record. Six consecutive games, home runs. I didn't really talk to the media that much. The streak is still on, I'm not talking about it, and uh, left the locker room. Everybody wanted to talk about it except me. Junior sends a high five ball, Dalton, deep to center field. It is grand salami time, and Junior becomes only the third man in Major League history to hit home runs in seven consecutive games. The thing that my dad said is just uh, pick out one pitch that you can hit and hit it hard. And if it goes out, it goes out. And that's all I thought about. Here it goes! See you later! Upper deck, Griffey has tied the Major League record! Holy cow, the kid has done it! To hit eight home runs in eight consecutive games is a pretty special thing. It's, you know, it's been done twice before him, but uh, it's not something that you figure you're going to see very often. Eight home runs in, in eight games, uh, that's, that's just a tremendous feat. People just don't realize how hard it is to do. In 1995, Randy Johnson dominated the game of baseball and became Seattle's first Cy Young winner. One and two from Randy Johnson. Got it. And Davis, oh, snaps the bat. Bo Jackson light. He's got that dominating uh, uh, appearance on the mound. He's 6'10", the long hair, the, the mustache, throws the ball in the uh, low hundreds when he wants to. Well, Johnson, fast, fast, and incredibly fast, 98 miles an hour. You know, most guys that throw that hard don't have the ability to locate like Randy does, and uh, it's amazing what he does. Johnson off to a great start. Swing and a miss, strike three. Randy Johnson strikes out a couple. He'll take over a game. I just stand in the outfield and just watch him. Strike three, call, and he does it. He has a magnificent five-hit shutout. And Randy goes to six and oh my, oh my. What a game for the big unit tonight. I think even my teammates feel that if they get me a couple of runs that we're okay. Uh, I, mean, I, I feel that because some of them have told me that. If we score one run, we feel that, uh, you know, we can stay in an outfield and just let them go through nine innings after we score. Randy also became the first Mariner pitcher to start an All-Star game in 95 and finished the year with 18 wins, 294 strikeouts, and a league-leading 2.48 earned run average. He was, quite simply, awesome. The way he carries himself, the way his, the way he acts, the way he walks on and off the field, the way he clutches, the way he punches people out, blows people away, does his little annex. You can tell when Randy's really locked in, has his great stuff. No balls, two strikes. Oh, what a pitch from Johnson! Oh, and Hubbard tips his cap to Randy. Every time that the team was down, uh, lose a couple of games, there comes Randy pitch great whole year and give us a win and we start winning streak again. 
Ground ball hit to the shortstop Soho. He'll underhand and the ball game is over as Cora gets it. And Randy Johnson has gone all the way again. Randy goes to nine and one on the year. I always try and go out there with the uh, a confidence level that uh, you know you're going to have to hit my best pitch, and I, I don't mind giving up hits. And the bottom line for me is, hey, I, all I want to do is win. I mean, if I strike out a lot of guys, if I should throw a no hitter, if I should throw a shutout, if I should throw a low hit game, all that stuff is extra. But the bottom line is. Uh, all my teammates are looking for me to do is keep them in the game, and uh, I'm a little selfish when it comes to wanting to win. And that's all I want to do is just win. The year was 1995. The Mariners and the California Angels had finished the regular season in a dead heat and a one-game playoff at the Kingdom in Seattle was necessary to determine the winner of the American League West. This is a once-in-a-lifetime event for my son. Hems are going to win today. Woo! Mariners by about 45 runs. Uh, Californians go home and sit in the sun. Big unit! Big unit! <laughs> the big story for Seattle was Cy Young Award winner Randy Johnson facing the man he was traded for, Mark Langston. And on the game's first pitch, defense prevailed. And the wind in the first pitch swung on and popped down the right field line. Foul territory, Tino a long run. He did that! First play! Amazing catch by Tino Martinez! After that, it was all big unit. And here comes the one-two pitch. To J.T. Snow on the way. He went around! And Randy Johnson strikes out the side here in the fifth. He struck out the side in the third. He's blowing him away, no doubt. No doubt about it. You could tell his body language, the way he carried himself, everything was incredible. It was a, a look of, you know, determination. And, um, you know, I think uh, our team was pretty determined that day. Basically, it was right in front of us, uh, you know, the one-game playoff, and it's just what it was. Seattle finally broke the scoreless tie in the bottom of the fifth. The duo pitch to Coleman. Swung on, base hit left field. Here comes Wilson Anderson with a throw to the plate, and it is not in time. Now it's in one to nothing. Ben Coleman, RBI single. Then two innings later, with the bases loaded, Luis Soho brought massive doses of delirium to the kingdom. Here's the pitch, swinging the ground ball up the first baseline, and it sneaks down. such a close fought game all the way up to there and then all of a sudden the floodgates opened up it was just you know you, you felt you felt really confident because Randy was in total charge of the game the way he was throwing but at the same time you didn't want to get too high I mean it was like one of those deals was like oh god let's just hurry up and get it over with hurry up and get the last out myself I was happy about getting the runs but I also knew because I got those runs now it was going to be my job to not let them uh, get any runs the Angels and just shut the door because it was late in the game and I had two more innings to uh, shut the door and then we would be AOS champions. And Randy Johnson shut that door as only Randy Johnson can. The one-two pitch, he is turning it over. Randy looks to the skies as the Mariners now erupt. 19 long years of frustration is over. This is where we wanted to win in the first place. And uh, we, won it, baby. We, won it. we finally got a chance to do it and uh, you know, I'm glad we did it here. The 1995 Division Series against the Yankees began in New York, where the Bronx Bombers captured the first two games. But when the series moved back to Seattle, the Mariners regrouped. They won game three and opened the door for a dramatic game four, one that would become part of Seattle lore. Home was a haven for Seattle, but now in this do-or-die situation, the Yankees scored early and often. 
Paul O'Neill with a two-run home run. The Yankees now lead five to nothing. Seattle faced a formidable challenge, a courageous comeback. But then why should this game be any different? Basically, like all year long, to have our backs up against the wall one more time, uh, being able to have to step forward and do it and being able to do it, uh, it just showed the character of that club as a special year. Seattle's quest began at the ground floor in the bottom of the third when the red-hot Martinez came up with two on. I was in a very good groove. I was very positive all series. I knew that uh, I was feeling very well, the place in the ball good, so mainly was a lot of confidence. The 0-1 pitch on the way, swing and a fly ball down the left field line and deep. Goodbye, baseball! The Mariners are back in it, and it's now the Yankees 5 and the Mariners 3. Seattle added another third inning run to make it 5-4 and tied the game at five in the fifth. And then, in the sixth, Junior. The pitch, swing and a fly ball deep in the left field. Back she goes, day, day, goodbye, baseball! And the Mariners take the lead, six to five over the Yankees. Here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Ah, yes, but the Yankees fought back in the top of the eighth and retied this phenomenal game at six. Once again, the focus turned to Edgar. Bases loaded against the Yankees' closer, John Wetland, bottom of the eighth. I remember that when I stepped up to the plate, I knew the situation. And at the time, I was trying just to uh, at least produce one, one run for the team. Here comes the 2-2 pitch to Edgar Martinez down. The fastball swung on hit the deep center field. He hit the ball really well to center field. I didn't think it was going to go out at the time, but for some reason, just keep going. Get out the right bread and the mustard this time, Grandma! It is a grand salami! And the Mariners lead it 10 to 6! I don't believe it! My, oh my! Boy, it was a great thrill just going around the bases and listening to the crowd and, and get everybody excited about uh, the game and the series. Martinez set a one-game postseason record with seven runs batted in. The Yankees, having led the series two games to none, were now in a dead heat with one game to go. The climactic finale of the 95 Division Series also took place at the Kingdome, and a three-game sweep was on Seattle's mind. It sure was good to be home. Being at home, as loud as that place was and having all those people packed in there, there's no doubt that if you ask any of the people that played in there that year throughout, I mean, ask any of the Yankees, they'll tell you how, how loud it was. David Cohn cut through the noise for the first two innings, but Seattle cut loose in the third. Fastball swing and a fly ball deep to right field. O'Neal going back. Goodbye, baseball. One inning later, with one man on against Andy Bennis, it was Paul O'Neill who went deep to right to give the Yankees a two-to-one lead. But in the bottom of the fourth, Muner tied it up again at two. The scales tipped back the Yankees' way in the sixth when Don Mattingly drove in two with a double, and the 4-2 lead sent Seattle silent. But with this man on your team, it is never over. I just wanted to contribute to the team. I, I was out for a long period of time, and uh, they needed a boost, and I just wanted to give them that boost that uh, we needed. Griffey's blast brought Seattle within one at four to three, but it also seemed to rattle the unflappable cone. David's game-long pinpoint precision began to leave him, and with the bases loaded and two out, Doug Strange battled his way to a full count. Then as the kingdom thundered around him, Cone lost all control. Yeah! 
With the game now tied at four, Seattle fans witnessed the incredible sight of Randy Johnson coming out of the bullpen. And they're going to go down and get the big guy, Randy Johnson, and listen to this ovation when the Cy Young is called in. Listen to this. A situation where it was you know a must-win situation so you know if if we lose I got all offseason and let my arm rest Johnson held fast through the ninth and the tenth but in the eleventh inning Randy Velarde sliced out a hit and the Yankees took a five to four lead New York was now just three outs from the league championship series <laughs> But resilience was Seattle's creed all season, and in the bottom of the 11th, down 5-4, to four, Joey Cora took on Jack McDowell. And the wind of the 2-1 pitch to Joey Cora now. He punched the ball up the first baseline. It's a dandy, and he is going to be safe again! And that set the stage once again for the man who had already hit five home runs in the series to tie Reggie Jackson's record for the most home runs in a series. But all Seattle fans now ask from Griffey was to keep this precious inning alive. The 1 0 pitch on the way to Junior now. It swung on on a ground ball base in the right center field. Burr's going to end up at third. And the Mariners have runners at first and third, and nobody out here in the bottom half of the 11th. My, oh, my. And who better to earn his place as a hero than the magnificent Martinez? Edgar especially was just uh, totally dominated the whole series and, and uh, just being able to get him to the plate as hot as he was and his confidence level is the way it was, he knew something special was going to happen. The line doesn't look me alive for a base hit. Here comes Joy. Here is Junior to third base. They're going to wave him in. The throw to the plate will be late. The Mariners are going to play for the American League Championship. I don't believe it! It just continues! My, oh my! I started laughing at first, and, uh, and then I realized I'm the one guy that doesn't need to be on the bottom because I'm the one with a broken arm. And uh, I tried to get up and couldn't, so uh, you know, the main thing is the game was over and try to get in the locker room and celebrate there instead of uh, celebrating on the field because uh, we did it as a group and we should celebrate as a group. It was just uh, a year that, uh, you know, will be hard to duplicate and in the sense that uh, there were so many magical things that so many individuals on this team did to contribute to get to where we were that uh, it can uh, only be uh, relived on video. It was just an incredible year for everybody. Next stop, Jacobs Field for Game 3 of the 1995 American League Championship Series against Cleveland. Randy Johnson was on the mound for Seattle, taking on baseball's winningest team in 1995. But it was the Mariners who took the early lead. Swung on on a fly ball into deep left field. Albert Bell looks up and that will fly away. And Martinez breaks the bat. Espinosa botches the play at third, and an unearned run comes home. And Seattle leads 2-0. Seattle's lead was cut to one in the fourth. And with nobody on base in the eighth, a truly unexpected play set the stage for disaster. Right field, Buner a few steps back to the edge of the track. The ball really carrying, and it folded. Espinosa's heading for second, and he slowed up at first base. Watching that play, we'll have to see how they score it. The potential tying run was now on second, thanks to the two-base error by Buner. Espinosa was replaced by a pinch runner. And Kenny Lofton came to bat with a most fortuitous opportunity to tie the game. And this one is slashed to the hole for a base hit. Kirby around third. Coleman charging. There'll be no play at the plate. The game is tied. Buhner knows it shouldn't be that way, and his expression in right field tells you that. Nobody said a word. <laughs> Nobody said a word to me. I think they all, they all knew. 
I think everybody knows. Uh, you know, you got to know when you know a guy needs a pat on the back, when a guy needs to be kicked a little bit. And, um, nobody needs to say anything to me at that point. Seattle's future? Well, it looked bleak as the game moved to the 11th. In 14 extra inning games in 95, Cleveland had won 14. But with two on in the top of the 11th, Buhner sought redemption. Swung on and a fly ball, a deep to right center field. Ramirez to the track, the wall, fly away! Jay Buhner has just given the Mariners a 5-3 lead. So Buhner homers, gives one back with an error, and then it's another homer, a three-run shot, and the Mariners are up. Uh, there's no doubt when I hit it, it was like total relief for me. Um, I didn't want to have to go throughout the whole winter knowing that uh, that one ball right there, that boot, was going to you know, be hanging over my head all year, especially to take as much pride and joy as I do in my defense. You know, it was a great feeling for me, but it was even more special to look down there and see the whole bench coming out and meet me, you know, high-fiving me, being right there. I mean, you know, it was almost like they were right there with me. The whole, they knew how I felt. Seattle held the fort in the bottom of the 11th for the 5-2 to two win and a two games to one lead in the series. As Jay Buhner joined the exclusive club of those who went from GOAT to HERO in the same game. Put that one on the Ken Griffey highlight reel. Are you kidding me with this guy? Come on now. Wow. What a play. I mean to tell you, this guy is on a different planet. Faster than a speeding bullet, leaping ballparks in a single bound. Ken Griffey Jr. makes a Mariners moment most every time he makes a catch. We could talk about uh, the catches that Jr. made uh, for the next half hour. Griffey going back to the wall, leaps up at his side, catches the ball! Jr. with another spectacular catch! I do take a lot of pride in my defense, but I don't think about you know making a great play. I try to make the routine plays and if I make a, a great play then that's a bonus. Holy smoke what a play by Ken Griffey Jr. He'll climb the wall like Spider-Man. Ken Griffey on the run at the wall he leaps and makes a spectacular catch. His first most famous catch was the one that he went over the fence in Yankee Stadium. Griffey going back to the 1A track leaps high in the air and he's got it. It's the first time I've ever robbed somebody of a home run. The catch that he made when he when he broke his wrist, and I, I hate to allude to that, but that, that is as fine a major league play as, as I have ever seen. On the run, Griffey up against the wall, jumps up, and he makes the catch and crashes into the fence. An incredible, an incredible catch by Ken Griffey Jr. I'm an outfielder. It's important for us to, to go out there every day and not be afraid of running into a wall. Long run, Griffey reaches up at the wall and he makes the catch. It's like going out and playing with Superman every day. Uh, he's something so special. I mean, to go out and watch him uh, on a nightly basis is a treat to me, just like it is to all the fans. His name's not Griffey, his name's Superman. There's no doubt he's made some incredible plays. I mean, there, it seems like every game he makes an incredible player does something special. Griffey flying over to make another incredible catch. He's made uh, a plethora of great catches since I've been here, and he's very enjoyable to watch in the outfield. This guy just turned 21, leading baseball and hitting. Alec is, uh, have so, so much talent. Man, this kid is absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, there's no doubt that this kid uh, is, is the real deal. How good is this guy? How good can you be at this age? <laughs> Unbelievable. Alex is, I mean, you could tell from day one what kind of player he was uh, when we seen the films on him, that he was going to be a, a great ball player. I don't know what else to say about him. We're done. We've said everything we possibly can say about this kid. He's having a kind of year that you dream about having. It was no dream in 96 when Alex Rodriguez became the youngest shortstop ever to be named to the All-Star team. Defense is great. What a play! Alex Rodriguez! He can run. He's very fast. Runner goes down at second. With a stolen base goes Alex Rodriguez. He can hit the ball anywhere on the field with 
uh, Bauer. Look at the power by Rodriguez the opposite way. And there's no doubt that Alex is a type of player that is a big impact player. The attitude that he brings uh, to the ballpark every day uh, on the field and in our clubhouse and the way he hustles on the field and at the same time the glove that he brings. Uh, with his ability, uh, I believe that with more experience, he's just going to get better. The one-two pitch. Swing and a line drive in the gap in right center. Dropped in a base hit. Here comes the winning run. Strange from third. Alex Rodriguez wins the ball game. Three to two here in the bottom of inning number 12. Holy smoke. What a way to start the 1996 season. But that was just the beginning. Alex led the league with a 358 average, 141 runs scored, three grand slams, and 54 doubles. He finished three votes shy of the Most Valuable Player Award. What a year he had his first full season in the major leagues. Uh, just an outstanding, outstanding first year. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a career year for anybody else, and it, let's hope that he can duplicate uh, many of those. Man, was that ball smacked. He launches another one. That ball just jumps off this young man's bat. And Alex is showing his strength. Talking about his power, he is so strong. I knew I could play at the major league level the year before. Then Lou gave me the opportunity in 96. And uh, it was a breakthrough year for me. It was a magical season. It was a surprise for me, my family. But I, I take it with a grain of salt. He handled everything very well. He, uh, he tried to not to make a big deal out of it. Uh, and that's the way to go. Stay aggressive, but at the same time, stay disciplined. And it's a fine line that you have to find. And uh, this year is a very big challenge, and I have to come out and uh, do my best and not put too much pressure on myself. The first 20 years of Mariners baseball has seen its share of memorable moments with many more still to come. As the Mariners emerge as one of the, the top teams in all of baseball with the fanfare, and other notoriety we, we, we receive. I think it's gonna keep going. Here's goes, it's outside, throw through the second is not in time, he's tied the record. Here he is, into the wind, and the 2-2 pitch on the way, and the breaking ball, swing and a miss, and he's got it! He has the American League strikeout championship! And the sky's the limit for this organization, there's no doubt this organization's come a long way. And the 1-2 pitch on the way to Jimmy, swung at, well hit ball, deep to left field, Mexico's goodbye baseball! Coleman one out away. It is 9.53 at night. The pitch swung on and a fly ball belted deep to right. Cut up to the track. Fly away. So one pitch away from perfection. What we did in 95, there's no doubt, changed the way things will be around here for, for a long time. Put it up. Oh, baby. The big unit does it again. Mariners exemplify what, what a major league team should be as a first-class organization. I see nothing but good things coming to the Mariners. Well, hopefully uh, we can throw some banners up there. That's what we all play this game for is to, to be on a championship team and hopefully in the next couple years, even this year, we can do it. Oh my, I don't believe it!